sociologist with a research interest in uh, human, non-human uh, relations. And he's uh, studied uh, the British uh, animal uh, protection uh, movement and uh, social movements uh, in general. Uh, his latest uh, journal publication was about the potential criminalization of uh, protests uh, in Ireland. And today he's going to speak about towards uh, understanding the human uh, non-human uh, relations. Which is pretty easy to do in 20 minutes. So, uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thanks, uh, thanks for coming to my session. Um, you know, sociologists are always you know, incredibly uh, grateful that anyone who listens to them. So uh, thanks for that. And thanks for the organisers uh, to, uh, to invite me now. Yeah, so I'm a sociologist for my sins, currently working at UCD. But I do have... Good to work. I do have an activist background, and if you like, this is my activist uh, CV. So the, the top part is really from the 1980s, um, especially things like um, BOAB, that was 1982, the Sea Shepherd uh, involvement, that, those kind of things. And a bit lower down, that's the current kind of thing that I'm doing. So the reason that I show this is not to show off, it's to to say that I've been on both sides of the divide, in a sense, so the activist side and, and, the, and the academic side. And what I've done is I've used the academia to try and feed into some understanding of the activist uh, side of things, so that's how it kind of works. In fact, um, as Martin said, we, I, I did uh, look at the British protection movement on the uh, MA level, and then in terms of my research work, I looked at the support pillars of cultural speciesism, which are philosophy and theology, as I mentioned, and also everyday social practice. And obviously, as a sociologist, it's the everyday social practice that's uh, interesting to me. And uh, in fact, one of the things that I do, one of the talks I do based on the work, um, actually it wouldn't work in this audience, because what I would do is I would give people pen and paper and ask them very simply to draw a farm. Yeah? And you can guarantee that most of the drawings that come back are of an entirely free-range farm, the, the, the uh, smiling farmer and the smiling wife and the, the chicken scratching in the dirt, the, the pig in the mud pool and the ponds with, with the ducks, etc., etc. In other words, something completely removed from what we understand as animal advocates uh, about the reality of life for uh, animals which are regarded as if they were food. So, I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to focus on is I'm really going to kind of look at the social construction of moral in and out groups. And I'm going to try and do that in a couple of ways. One is just to give us some sociological understanding of, about how we construct different groups and how we can push uh, people and other beings away uh, in that sense. And also, I think it says something about the social movement that we're in as well, or the social movements that we may be. Involved. So that's the aim, whether I succeed is another matter, but we'll, we'll see. So we start off with uh, Bauman and Reagan. Now Bauman is a sociologist, and Tom Reagan probably doesn't need any introduction in this audience in the sense that he wrote The Case for Animal Rights in 1983, so well-known animal rights philosopher. And what they both say uh, in different places is that the universe of moral obligations is remarkably non-universal. What Bauman says is that human beings have demonstrated the apparent need to draw categorical distinctions and differences between groups. Reagan, for his uh, argument, says that there are exercises of exclusion that have led to what he regards as the formation of non-ideal moral communities. Both of the theories suggest further that a great deal of effort has been expended by human beings in guarding these very carefully drawn boundaries. So advocates for animal rights and people involved in social movements in a general sense are challenging some of the relevance of this moral boundary drawing, but through Bauman's analysis we can see sociologically that there's a great deal of benefit that has been brought over the years for the people who draw these boundaries. Boundary drawing then is a very powerful method of defining my group and pushing others away into stranger categories, etc., etc. A person's early social lessons, and sociologists would call that socialization, involve 
boundary drawing and creating these very meaningful us and them categories that we have in our minds. Now these are often based on visible distinctions and differences, so we can see some differences and we often base it on that, but they also frequently rely on taught worldviews, which are transmitted generationally. Now historically, there have been quite a few of these. What I just picked out a couple of four really for illustration. What they tend to do as an overall package is paint the other in a very negative light. So if you like, this is a, a biggie in that sense, but this is the Nazi construction of Jews, which was uh, encompassed in that slogan, Jews equals lice equals typhus. This is a more kind of patriarchal uh, idea that men are rational beings, whereas women are merely emotional, and I'm not going to get involved with that argument at, at the moment. Um, <laughs> this is a, uh, a prop for slavery, that uh, persons of colour are uh, subhuman. And this is a more contemporary uh, argument, really, which is certainly prevalent at the moment in the United States presidential election. So, boundaries such as these, boundaries that we create and socially construct, effectively create moral distance with regard to those socially constructed other beings. So our boundaries keep the other away. So a, a sufficiency of distance, be it social, <coughs> be it moral, can result in untold cruelty to the other. And it can also mean that their rights will be trampled on and systematically violated. Now what Bauman says for us is that human beings live in the company of other people. We live in groups, and in those groups we interactively understand that we are very much dependent on one another. Now, Bauman himself says this is a rather banal point, but it's the banality of the point that gives it its sociological importance. It's the kind of, we don't need really much to think about this idea that gives, gives it its power, in a sense. Because living amongst others is to live in what Bauman calls manifold webs of human interdependency. So we're social beings, social animals, and we live in groups, and that group can exert a great hold on us. So in a very real sense, the group can make people. And that means that resisting the important messages of our group <coughs> is generally a relatively hard thing to do. Philosopher David de Grazier, for example, likewise suggests that some early socialized lessons <coughs> that we learn may be extremely difficult to negate or to successfully resist. Social attitudes and many internalized and institutionalized norms and values become so firmly sedimented into society, it means it's kind of really in, embedded and enmeshed into the very fabric of society, that breaking away from them, for some people, can be quite difficult. Now, I know it's the case that for some people, resisting can seem easy, but what they